Welcome back. I'm glad you've tuned in. Today it's going to be a fun one because the Destiny 2 community has got a pretty serious case of whiplash going on right now. I'll start us off with a quote. Facing the witness is not the end of Destiny 2 and it's definitely not the end of Destiny. Those are the words of the executive creative director Luke Smith as Bungie has actually managed to and I know it's weird to say but they've kind of stunned their fans and critics like seriously and given how rough the headlines were going going into this, I think that is a testament to how much people, in principle, like what they've shown off. So what's happened is there have been reveals for the final shape, there's entirely new gameplay, reward loops, and enemies that are kind of headlining this as major features. I mean, come on, a new enemy faction properly being in Destiny 2 that's not really an asset reuse thing like that's actually pretty damn great this is very much being framed as their most important expansion ever certainly their most do or die expansion and uh, if leaks are to be believed there's even a little bit of destiny 3 to be talking about but of course not before today's sponsor there ain't a sponsor but i do have an ask and it'll take you literally a few seconds would you consider hitting the subscribe button and the like button and i don't just say that to make a number go up the reason why i say is that it genuinely helps because it gives the YouTube algorithm a pretty much happy signal. And every time I actually say this, we see, you know, 500, 600, 800 subscribers within a single day. It really does matter. It helps what we do. And it's just a great way that you can um, support our team with, uh, you know, just a few seconds of your time. So thank you for listening and considering that. And with that said, Let's get to the rest of the video. Okay, let's get through the details. On the 4th of June, 2024, Destiny 2 The Final Shape will launch. It was delayed though, right? It was delayed from February. And very much when that happened, I think we all assumed that it was really behind schedule, that they probably needed a delay or else it would have been a shit show. Basically, we all, I think, assumed it was a defensive play, right? Trying to avert a disaster rather than trying to uh, do something a little bit, you know, above and beyond. One person working in that team actually reached out to a journalist and said, hey, uh, what if we use those few months to actually cook? And we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, what this has all culminated in, though, this kind of campaign they've been drumming up for The Final Shape, is their third developer showcase stream that served essentially as the pre-launch of their new in-game season, Into the Light. Into the Light is not really a full fat uh, season. It's, uh, I suppose you could say, like a little bit more uh, budget and, uh, and and fun. I know that sounds really weird, but basically they knew there was a delay and they put something in the game to tide people over. The main thing that that has been is uh, a new game mode, Onslaught, that actually looks pretty damn fun. More noteworthy, though, is the final shape. And just to give you an example of the core Destiny community opinions there, take um, Aztec Ross, right? Uh, I mean, it, this video is very positive. The description of it, though, I think is what I want to read. Today, Today, we got another look at Destiny 2's final chapter, and it was definitely more than any of us could have asked for or expected. That's a pretty big statement. And again, remember the context here. In previous Destiny coverage, right, the GDC talk had been talked about a hell of a lot. And that GDC talk, it was saying, don't over deliver, you know, don't, don't set a precedent that you don't think you can actually match going on. And amid the game having issues at that time, we all sort of thought, ah, yeah, hmm. This feels like the minimum they can get away with. Something like that, what I just read about this being more than anyone could have asked for or expected, that, uh, that is, I think, an actually a meaningful statement coming specifically from the Destiny community. Uh, to go over to another person who will actually later in today's uh, show confirm some leaks, we do have Paul Tassi saying, back when I was negative about uh, the first final shape reveal, someone at Bungie told me, quote, what else do you think we might now have time to add with this kind of delay? And he goes on to say, and so here we are, legit blew me away. That's fairly interesting, the idea there that somebody reached out and said that with this additional time, we've been able to cook a little bit more. We've been able to make some new features. And I think Paul did a pretty good job of characterizing the community sentiment in the lead up to this. So Bungie had hyped it quite a lot. And as, as Paul puts it, people had this very much, you know, fool me once mentality going into it. And look, I feel you, you know, I've been doing Warcraft stuff for a decade. I know what it is like to be disappointed continually, to feel like a studio is not listening and to have that deep skepticism about uh, anything, right? That even if there is a good thing, 
hoping that somehow the monkey's paw will curl. Paul goes on to say that now, after the debut, there is just that feeling that they've blown past people's expectations, and he speaks of huge series changing developments. And the reason why I would sort of default go to Paul on this is because he does actually know people at Bungie. He can get pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good leaks, but also just confirmations and denials of things. And that will be relevant later in this video. So, Yes, after months of bullshit, after the worry that as an example, PlayStation management had pretty much put blame directly at Bungie's leadership and then a lot of staff thinking, oh, hang on a second, you guys could all leave in 2026 when the final vesting from the Sony acquisition happens. Do you really have our best interests at heart as employees who you would think want to be there for a long time? That's the kind of news story that's been going on. So that there's been a positive reaction at all, I think is pretty meaningful. And this tweet encapsulates it perfectly and it's one that very much uh, I just empathize with. If you're like, why are Destiny players so insane? I understand where you're coming from, but you have to understand we're rubber banding between we're so back and it's so over so fucking fast we can't see straight. Yes, as somebody who has been in the Warcraft trenches, I, I feel that profoundly. Let's actually get into some of the new things and uh, really the main thing is prismatic stuff, which basically seeps into a few of the new features. So technically there is about four additions to the final shape that they talked about. To say that though is almost downplaying it because these are going to be rather huge. The first thing is an entirely new subclass called the Prismatic, right? Now, the Prismatic basically lets you mix and match Arc, Solar, Void, Stasis, and Strand powers together um, with that depending on the overarching class, obviously, of your Hunter, Titan, and Warlock. So that is already pretty new and different, allowing you to mix and match things. It also comes with its own transcendent state. Basically, you pop avatar form and become very powerful. Powerful. You also, by the way, do get uh, a new grenade, right? That is, uh, you know, the sort of unique uh, prismatic one for your overall class. That uh, transcendence form also comes with further damage boosts. This, you may think, is not necessarily a big deal because it's blending things that already exist. And maybe you're thinking, no, I want something new. I get that. And what is new is your ability to actually play with these toys because effectively this unlocks a whole new combination of tools that people are already familiar with. And I think that's actually quite key to the player response here. People are already familiar with how Destiny plays, so now they understand how they can mix and match things, things that they know in depth. And that means that it feels tangibly exciting. So I think that's why that's going down particularly well with people. Beyond that, then, we uh, should talk about aspects and fragments. These are the customization perks of Destiny 2's subclasses. Prismatics do, of course, then get their own sets of those, as you'd expect. But because the Prismatic class is about remixing the abilities from the other subclasses, that means that the relevant aspects and fragments are unlocked a bit differently in that they're account-wide, which... Uh, <laughs> is brilliant. So these new aspects and fragments, you unlock them once and they will be playable on any of your other characters as, you know, assuming that of course they pertain to that character, which is good because as you're progressing your character, you're then thinking about your alts and basically your progression on your main has increased what you can do on your alts, which then makes that a more enticing prospect. That's exactly what I think works in today's market. And ultimately this means way more flexibility, way more build craft potential across the board, which I think is very positive. Positive, and uh, Bungie are then promising that they're just going to straight up be more perks given out in total. So you will be getting basically more and more things. You have more flexibility to play with those things and they overtly basically want you to make broken shit that's fun. Now there is a third part of this and that is exotic. So the current range of exotic class items is of course designed um, in a way that benefits from the, you know, the, the subclasses with their defined design and their elemental abilities. The prismatic ones though, are going to be a bit different. And this really is a new form of gear. So Bungie are introducing new exotics that will pretty much just change how you gear up your character, change how you play your class. They basically steal from a pool of random exotic effects from other bits of gear or sort of uh, inspired by other bits of gear. And it then combines them together and uh, well, you, you get a new thing and that can allow for entirely different effects new builds, that sort of thing. And you can roll them over and over again to just make more gear and see what fun shit you can do with the system. And that, of course, is tapping into a lot of the things that are very successful in the ARPG genre. Like whether you're talking about Diablo 4, which is trying really hard with its fourth season uh, to just rework so many aspects of itself um, with your last epochs and so on. So ultimately what this means is playing your class should really feel entirely different. Your possibility space will be hell of 
of a lot larger. And I think that's just kind of important because whenever you get incremental updates or just a tiny thing bolted on top and it's not really that much, like it's a cool thing. Sure, you might enjoy it when it comes out, but the idea that fundamentally a new form of gameplay has been cracked open by an addition. I think that's what really excites players. So this set, uh, this is smart. Do you know what it's probably not going to be though? Balanced. Now that does lead to lots of sweaty metagame problems. I have a feeling though that they're happy to just go fun and OP first. The developers in the stream actually did say that this exotic gear could end up being quote, a little game breaking. So look, I'm sure they will have to hot fix things that are like literally too broken or actually present like a legitimate social problem. But other than that, it seems like they're happy to just let people have fun with this system. That is great. And with a game like Destiny that so many people have went through, I think being able to see your friends sharing videos, Discord streams, seeing GIFs, things that you recognize being used in a way that, uh, that, that feels new and different. I think that's actually going to be exciting for reactivating the lapsed player base. And given the, uh, the players of Lightfall, given Bungie being 45% under the revenue target for uh, Lightfall um, a while ago, I feel like that lapsed Destiny community is really large. Um, I mean, at least it does include me. And when I've been looking at this, I am personally quite excited. Now, that being said, all of these cool new tools would be pointless if there was nothing new to do with them. Hello there, Suicide Squad, and uh, your interesting first season. Fortunately, what they've done, though, is add a whole new enemy faction. This was one of my major disappointments with the launch of Destiny 2. I didn't want a faction that I knew be reworked. Like, I wanted something that actually felt new. This however, is building on two existing enemy types by basically adding more enemy types to that faction to the point where they are kind of a full new faction. So it's not like the full addition of a faction because they've already existed. I can at least say as a lapsed player, I've never played with any of these enemies. So not only do we get kind of like big new abilities, uh, cool combinations of things, but we're also using them against enemies with a different design. Of course, being a long time, I wouldn't say fan anymore. I was certainly a fan of Bungie's output during the Halo days. And one of the great things about old school Halo was the combat sandbox, right? And even though I had a lot of criticisms of Destiny 1 when I was playing that, like right at its launch, the one thing I did like, these enemies, they feel good. Every one of them feels just a bit different to fight. So more on that sandbox is brilliant. Getting to the new enemies though. So Subjugators and Tormentors are already in the game and now they are being joined by uh, their fellow lads to basically form the Dread as a full new enemy faction. So we've got the Grim, the Husk, the Attendant and Weavers. So the Attendant and Weavers basically use Stasis and Strand to control you, right? Whether that means, you know, CCing you, moving you across the battlefield, that kind of thing. You know what? That could be cool, but man, whenever you're dealing with a loss of control for the player, that is a tricksy design space. There's then the Husk, which basically is a melee bruiser, and uh, the Grim, which uh, seemingly fly about the place and scream at you to suppress your abilities. So, it will be cool to see like how these actually shape up in combat. I think what's just exciting though is finally something new that is not just uh, an enemy you've already seen, but with a different color and uh, slightly different abilities. That I think is really good. And that actually makes this feel like, uh, well, like Destiny's being moving forward, which I think is one of the things a lot of these games can suffer from when it's just infinite live service and we're kind of getting lots of rehashings of things that we've seen, but not a lot like new. So I think this is the type of new that can actually serve to grow a franchise. All that being said, the campaign, narrative developments, post-launch content, like that stuff we don't know about. At least in the campaign, we know they can do really good work. Just look at Witch Queen. Obviously, Lightfall happened and its campaign, well, its campaign is not the worst in terms of its core gameplay. It's just more the narrative is so weird and, and miscalibrated and not what anybody wanted following Witch Queen. I mean, it's called Lightfall and then it ended up being a, more like an 80s action movie. Like, oh, I don't know. That's bizarre. I have to imagine though that they will be returning to form the last time that they were just really, you know, doing proper good serious shit in Witch Queen. That did work out well. It shows they have the chops. And if they do have those chops, surely, surely the end of their big, you know, 10 year arc, but surely that's when they're going to cook pretty hard. Obviously, while all this sounds good, I still say, do not pre-order, wait. 
Yes, wait until launch day to see how this actually is. To continue though, it's probably this lack of knowing about like uh, campaign details, etc., that led to Luke Smith being pretty clear with viewers when he said uh, facing the witness is not the end of Destiny 2. It's definitely not the end of Destiny. After you face the witness, we are going to tell you what's next in Destiny 2. And this actually does remind me of a very successful, I wouldn't say marketing, but more public positioning and sort of confidence building strategy that Blizzard did with World of Warcraft. I know you might think Blizzard, World of Warcraft confidence. Michael, you've absolutely lost your mind. Uh, yes, I have, but that's besides the point. I say this because obviously we had Battle for Azeroth which I suppose you could say was a bit like you guys having Lightfall. But after that, we had Shadowlands. That would be a bit like if the final shape was also a Lightfall. Maybe worse. Shadowlands was really shit. Warcraft was at an all-time low. Then Dragonflight happens. And Dragonflight, like by the technicals of its game design and its systems, infinitely better. Like, I think a really great expansion, but so goddamn unexciting, you know? It just did not have the narrative teeth that people wanted. Again, I think of Lightfall. So what Blizzard did at, uh, at BlizzCon is they, in a way, pulled a bit of a Marvel. So I'm sure you've seen across social media, you know, some Marvel person come up with a suit and uh, they'll just have a bunch of movie logos behind them for years and years and years. Now, obviously that's the kind of thing I normally roll my eyes at. With Warcraft though, it did do something that I think Bungie are seeking to replicate here. And it is to say, yes, there's this next thing coming up, but we have a direction, one we're willing to talk about publicly and commit to. Obviously, Bungie have actually done that before in how they talk about expansion. So again, I wouldn't be surprised if they do it here. So imagine you have the final shape, people play the campaign, hopefully enjoy the campaign, defeat the witness. And shortly after that, Bungie says, okay, hope you enjoyed that. Here is our big presentation of what's next. Because ultimately a risk factor that Bungie has here is you can only escalate and escalate and escalate within your current plot arc. You know, you can only do that so much, right? I mean, look at say Marvel struggling to fight audiences as much in the sort of post Infinity War or Endgame even era. I know a lot of people have just kind of decided, you know what, that was a good run. I'm, I'm done now. I'm done. I feel like I can check out. That's happened with quite a lot of different franchises. Even take Final Fantasy XIV. They did Endwalker, and then they did struggle to engage people a bit with the story that followed Endwalker through the patches. So if Bungie can say, Witness is dead, here's what's next. It's a big, cool presentation, and hopefully what, uh, you know, what is there with uh, post-Witness uh, content, you know, hopefully that's actually exciting and enticing. It would be a great shame if the Witness pulled a, ah, you do not understand, you cannot survive, what is to come? And then he dies. Guys. <sighs> Sorry, I still do try to work out the Shadowlands trauma when I can, because at least you guys got to laugh at me struggle. Anyway, to keep on going, um, after this live stream into the light, uh, of course, dropped, that brought with it just some stuff about uh, weapons, also Onslaught, which is their horde mode. Again, you know, you think Bungie? Uh, firefight in Halo. Probably about time they did a horde mode thing. And generally speaking, it's a very positive picture across the board. There are quibbles about balance, about sustainability, stuff like that, yes. And a lot of those longer term concerns that people have had based on a lot of the reporting, those still do exist. But at least they've been kind of put in the back burner in service of what appears to be tangible in the here and now. To do some top posts from the Reddit, watching this felt like a bad fake leak slash paste bin of the many we've seen over the years. Combining subclasses, I feel like I'm tweaking, thank you Bungie. That is the kind of response that you want from jaded players. Uh, somebody quoted uh, New Witness Faction The Dread, saying, holy shit, they finally did it, a brand new faction that isn't a spin-off. As somebody who played a bit of Destiny 1 and then kind of bounced off it, and played a lot of Destiny 2 at the start and a lot of Destiny 2 after uh, Forsaken and into Season of the Drifter, the idea of a new faction, that is actually something that piques my interest as a player who is not super engaged with the current lore, who doesn't really have a lot of detail about the game, but vaguely knows what Destiny uh, is. Because again, I haven't really been playing properly since Season of the Drifter. I bounced off uh, Shadowkeep. Yeah, Shadowkeep is the one that was a total dust. So my point there, if they're trying to target a player like me, they've quite successfully done so. And then if the details of the mechanical changes are enticing current players, that is definitely pointing to a pretty damn strong picture. To me, really, this clash of humongous drama and dissatisfaction rolling into this event, that combined with genuine excitement over what game developers uh, have made, just reinforces one of the core points, I think, that I like to put into this channel, which is that for every Ghostbusters cosmetic pack or egregious monetization decision like that stupid, uh, noob trap uh, starter pack that they tried to sell with Destiny. All of that bullshit, 
all of the annoying monetization stuff, all of the stuff forced in by the suits. And yes, of course, boneheaded design decisions as well. Even through all of that, there still are people who, number one, make a mistake, but genuinely are trying and, uh, you know, will course correct and do a better job. Point is, there's developers who are absolutely there trying to make uh, trying to make the best content they can because they also love Destiny. Maybe they work at Bungie because they played Halo when they were 14 and loved it and decided that's the career path they wanted. And I just bring that up to say that whenever we are going hard at companies for like, you know, decisions that publishers have made, some big team leadership decisions, yes, or maybe even little uh, sort of bits of design. But the core point is that in most cases, there's just developers everywhere trying, trying to do their best shit, trying to wade through all of the news that we talk about, just that of course we do that through the context of being customers. They wade through the same shit just through the context of trying to do their job and be developers. In this case though, obviously, do not pre-order based on anything that I have said, obviously, because the proof of the pudding is in the eating and it's not out yet. Now, this is where things do get uh, a little bit more interesting. So Luke Smith said that this isn't the end of Destiny and that leads me to Destiny 3. Here's basically the point. About a month ago, a leaker described the prismatic stuff pretty accurately and they also said Destiny 3 is is, and they do sort of caution that by saying was, they're not sure if it's still a thing, but Destiny 3 is in development under codename Payback. One of the big changes for Destiny 3 is for classes to no longer exist and allow any character to spec into any ability, since lore-wise there's no reason why you couldn't. As an example, they point out that hunters explicitly learned Blink from Warlocks, and Blink is not tied to a single element, so the logic fits. That's one thing, but there's another bit here as well. This eventually would be corroborated by Paul Tassi. I'll go to his tweet. He says, an update on this. The D3 leaker has posted a new comment after the reveal about payback. Separate from that, they posted about how trans devs were pushing for character re-editing to be a free feature in Destiny for years. I can directly confirm that, so I'm inclined to believe the rest. So the OP said this stuff about being able to like re-edit your character for free. He has independently heard the same thing, and that's making Paul think, okay, well, whoever this leaker is, they are clearly close enough to Destiny development to actually know something about it. Of course, though, standard caveat with leaks. The things in that leak are what that person thought to be the case at the time that they heard from their source. Things can change. I suppose the idea of a classless destiny, that's um, that's certainly uh, certainly interesting. I mean, that kind of thing for me worked out really well in, um, in Final Fantasy XIV. Don't know, maybe it'll happen here. It's not really a surprise though that Destiny 3 is going to be a thing, right? But you may wonder, well, why bother? Why just not make more Destiny 2? To be honest there, I just imagine they'd probably have engine updates uh, that they would want to make. They probably as well would be thinking about user-generated content. And I know it is totally the buzz nowadays to talk about Fortnite, where you can go to, you know, other islands and custom games, and people can actually uh, make money off that. The same in Roblox, which we'll be covering. That's the sort of the, the talk of the town. For a lot of people, though, that genuinely is where they think that, like, a lot of the future of um, just of game stuff can go. So if you're Bungie, well, you've already got experience with the Forge in Halo, Halo 3, Reach. Those were big for user-generated content. If you were able to get something like that existing within the framework of Destiny, and uh, that was happening in a new version of Destiny, you know, new uh, just engine changes, I don't know, that, that could be interesting. But again, we have also heard, and this may be out of date, but that their, uh, their tool set is a little bit of a nightmare to work with. Again, though, that is old information, and I don't think we've had the most fresh and crispy leaks on that. Anyway, I don't think any of that's going to be any time soon. I mean, Bungie have got to devote efforts to Marathon, and that, I think, just means that there will be another arc in Destiny 2, and I think Destiny 3 would happen after that arc. Now, of course, going to a lot of that prior reporting, the leaks from staff saying they're worried about the long-term future, you know, this is talking about the future to the point where it's almost not even relevant because... Just, uh, I don't know, the, the precision of anything that anybody could say is just I'm so up in the air because anything could change. Ultimately, though, what this shows is a player base being happy, right? A player base being happy, which is good because it's good that people are happy, like obviously, but uh, it just especially in contrast to the experience that, that player base has had. I think this is really good. I'm personally excited for it. And uh, you know what? This has successfully piqued my interest. I'm not pre-ordering, you shouldn't pre-order, but it is uh, in my consideration for the future. So yeah, nice we can end today on a happy note. That's it from me. Of course, I'll see you right back here tomorrow.